And we begin today at six with late breaking news, a story we're following out of the city's west side. You can see here from Sky 12, a growing police presence, several officers there on the scene of something happening at an apartment complex here. This is the Alizon Apache Courts. Yeah, Sky 12 over the scene right now. So far, details as to why officers are there haven't been made public. There are a lot of rumors, but we have yet to get anything confirmed when we do. We're going to bring that to you. We also have a new crew on the way. We're going to update you as soon as we have more information right here on air and of course online at ksat.com. A San Antonio police officer without a job tonight after body cam footage shows the moments that officer opened fire on two teenagers in a parking lot of a fast food restaurant. They were sitting in a car there eating a burger. The shots fired by that officer seriously injured the driver. We do want to warn that you may find this video disturbing. Get out of the car. What? This video shows the moment that San Antonio police officer James Brennan opened fire on that car with two teenagers inside it. This happened on Sunday around 1045 p.m. at a McDonald's on the 11,700 block of Blanco Road. The driver who appears to have been caught off guard has been identified as 17 year old Eric on Police say that's his name. This incident was not connected, though, to the initial call. He was there for a, for a disturbance uh, at the McDonald's. Uh, he was distracted by a vehicle that he believed he saw the previous night and tried to stop, but it evaded. And then he decided to go over and approach that vehicle. The police say Officer James Brennan believed the car was stolen, called for backup. However, as seen in the video, he did not wait for that backup. He instead walked up to the vehicle, opened the door, told Cantu to get out. After the car moved in reverse, the officer opened fire. He was placed on administrative duty following the shooting Tuesday. Police Chief William McManus says he was fired for violating the department's tactics and procedures. Both the city manager and the mayor have released statements in support of the chief's quick actions on this. It will be up to the district attorney's office to determine if Brennan will be facing any charges. Cantu was taken to a hospital. He is expected to be OK. Two charges are pending as of now. And now to a small community with a pretty big problem in the hill country town of Gray Forest. More than half of the full time police officers have resigned. Resignations were submitted by two full time police officers and the police chief. So what about safety concerns from people who live there? The Gray Forest mayor says the city is making moves to make sure their police department stays in service. We have an interim police administrator. I've talked to somebody this morning about being interim chief. He's actually one of our current reserve officers. We still have, I believe it's 42 reserves on duty. They're patrolling, they have eight hour shifts. They patrol right on through. We've talked to Bear County, they're helping cover, especially until all of this just settles down. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says the city of Gray Forest falls under their area of operation, so BCSO will provide reinforcement as needed. The mayor adds that she believes the police chief resigned due to, quote, philosophical differences. But we're not done asking questions about what's going on here. The Nightbeat team is working on this story right now. People in Gray Forest, they want to know how much this is costing the city. We will have that story, an update on this, tonight at 10. The candidates for Bear County judge facing off today in a forum. This comes just days after the Republican candidate Trish DeBerry accused Democratic candidate Peter Sakai of lying about not having anything to do with so-called dark money attack ads against her. Yeah, our Erica Hernandez was at that forum where an exchange got heated when that issue was brought up. Transportation, infrastructure, economy and the Bear County Jail, all topics discussed at the Bear County Judge Candidate Forum hosted by the North San Antonio Chamber. I'm a unifier, not a divider. I'm all in to be your next Bear County Judge. While the majority of the debate was focused on county issues, the elephant in the room was Trish DeBerry's recent press conference about dark money attack ads against her. When the question was brought up, DeBerry doubled down, attacking Sakai and accusing him of knowing something and saying this was an attack against women. Peter? The Bear County judge's seat is not for sale. It doesn't go to the highest bidder. 
And you can say all day long, you know nothing about this, but you do. Sakai again denying the allegations. All I can say is I have our campaign has nothing to do with that act, period. You have stated at that press conference that you have no evidence connecting me. Evidence. And on the rule of law, if you make an accusation, you must have concrete evidence to support that. After the forum, Sakai commenting more about the personal attacks to Barry hurled at him. She is challenging my integrity. She's challenging my reputation. She's challenging my character. And I find it very offensive. And DeBerry says she's not backing down and will continue to bring up the issue. I was not satisfied with his response at all. I'm going to continue to call him out on his association with his dark money pack. Uh, you can't hide behind the curtain. This isn't the last time these two will face off. In fact, they have several more forums and debates scheduled in the coming weeks. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. They believe gun laws and the safety of children are on the ballot this November. That is the message from Uvalde families today as they met with Democratic elected leaders to demand something changes. As our Lee Waldman explains, they believe the Robb Elementary tragedy could have been prevented. Standing together where they did four months ago. This building is a little hard for me to come back to. It's a little hard. Um, for these families, it's going to be hard. So. Please have patience. Where they were told their loved ones weren't coming home. On May 24th, 2022, I left a piece of my heart at Rob Elementary and she never made it home to me. Families of victims and survivors came together again to demand changes to gun laws. I promised her that day that I was going to fight, you know, for her, her friends, the future generations, um, the survivors, and that, that's my. <laughs> That's what I promise, that's what I'm going to do. Speaking alongside Texas Democrats in office and running this November, those most affected by the Rob shooting asked for comprehensive background checks and for the age to purchase an assault style weapon to be raised from 18 to 21. 18 year old should have no right to purchase a weapon. She caused such a weapon that's used in combat should stay in combat. For some of these families, it was their first time speaking after this tragedy, but they felt compelled to be the voice for their children as we near elections. He was still able to legally pass a background check before buying two AR-15 semi-automatic rifles and murdered 21 lives. In a statement from Governor Greg Abbott's office today, he reiterated that it is unconstitutional to raise the age to purchase a semi-automatic weapon from 18 to 21. Instead, stating in part, quote, Governor Abbott continues to work on solutions focused on the root of the problem, mental health, unquote. Beto O'Rourke has challenged Governor Abbott's stance on constitutionality. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. An arrogant leader who didn't know the law. Prosecutors continue to paint a dreadful picture of Michelle Barrientes Vela weeks after a jury convicted her of tampering with government records. But as Dylan Collier reports, the fifth day of sentencing for the ex-constable could have been much, much worse. Once members of the same administration, Michelle Barrientes Vela faced the harsh reality this morning that her former captain, Mark D. Garcia, had flipped on her and agreed to testify for the prosecution. Sources said Garcia, who was scheduled to go to trial late next month for felony perjury, agreed to turn state's witness Tuesday night in exchange for his criminal charges being dismissed. But what would have likely been hours of damaging testimony against his one-time boss, temporarily thwarted by a conflict of interest. His attorney, Mark Anthony Sanchez, represented body and Vela in multiple civil lawsuits related to her criminal charges. Day five of sentencing was not without its explosive moments. Precinct two court staff, including Judge Roberto Vasquez, revealed that Barrientes Vela's deputies forced defendants with warrants to pay up before getting to see a judge. When the then constable was informed of her rule breaking and shown the code of criminal procedure, she pushed the documents away. Her letting me know that she knew the code of criminal procedure better than any lawyer or judge, so I didn't have to worry about it. 
Judge Vasquez in Barrientes Velas defense attorney sparred off and on for hours. I'm not watching, so if you if you like just object loud, I'll stop. Yeah, you don't tell anyone to object. Oh, oh, okay, thank you, sir. Can we keep going in my apartment, please? The push to get Garcia on the stand, whenever that may be, signals that the prosecution is trying to get jail time for Barrientes Vela, though it will likely be far less than the maximum 10 years she's facing. Reporting downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic on this Wednesday. Let's go to 281 in San Pedro. It was busier earlier, and it's still pretty busy, especially northbound, but things are moving a lot smoother than they were just about an hour ago. You can see the brown patches of the grass there. They're starting to get a little bit bigger. We are waiting on rain, but in the meantime, Sarah Spivey, things pretty pleasant out there. Yeah, I know. If we can't get the rain, at least the weather is nice outside, and it is. It's 87 degrees. Dew points are in the low 50s, so nice with low humidity. Tonight's going to be great. We're going to see temperatures fall into the low 70s by midnight, much like the last several evenings. All right, in the pollen count today, finally, ragweed is not in the matter, moderate category. Molds and ragweed are low. The aquifer is down another three tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. We could use some rain, but right now the only thing we're seeing on the radar those pesky butterflies that end up on your windshield. They're showing up here, those snout nosed butterflies. I've got a look at the tropics coming up in just a bit. All right, thanks, Sarah. Straight ahead, the beauty of the West Side captured in paintings that are set to be showcased this weekend. We're talking to some of the artists about their inspiration, and we're giving you a preview of their work. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and tonight on the night beat, a teenager in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was going to go pick up his brother that day, and he just, he wasn't able to make it. That mom from Uvalde says that her son was innocent, caught in a gang-related shooting. Now, he survived, and now she's talking about what happened and the change that she wants to see in their community. Also, it's been a week since Hurricane Ian made landfall along Florida's coast, and Texans are still doing their part to help how one San Antonio business is contributing to the search and rescue efforts there. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Mujer Artes, a group of local women artists showcasing treasures of the West Side through Loteria. They're styled paintings. Each card displays an iconic West Side person or place. That exhibit is set to open this Saturday at the Esperanza Center. Archimelia Wada spoke with the artists about the memories that are found in each painting. We can do it, we can do it, but let's do a West Side Loteria and everybody agree. And I remember this. Terry Borrego is one of nine artists that created these clay acrylic pieces. All the artists are familiar with the West Side where Hispanics are historically the majority. Borrego says she wants people to see the beauty in her community. Most of the time it's a negative comment that I hear and I said, well, we're going to make this a positive thing. People are going to see what we're doing. Each artist painted something that was special to them. She has a mariachi connection here, and th this is like Elvis, you know, that Mexican Elvis that just died. That was pretty popular here in San Antonio. We try to bring up places that are old, but people don't even know about them. So now they'll know once they see it. Anna Uvedo painted Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe Church. Catholic churches are often tied to Hispanic culture, not just as a place of worship, but often as the heart of a neighborhood. Uvedo says this is where she met her husband, who was raised by the priest. He would tell me he'd re ring the church bells at six in the morning, and uh, he was always with the priest. I will uh, never forget this humble neighborhood the story, my story of the West Side boyfriend, <laughs> now my husband of 61 years. Each of their personal stories is written on the back. Each is available for sale and the money will support their future art projects. Each of these paintings is only a small window into the West Side. But seeing it for yourself can give you a new perspective. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Loteria del West Side Mujer Artes exhibit and the sale opens this Saturday, October 8th at 6 o'clock. That's at the Esperanza Center. It is located at 922 San Pedro Avenue. That exhibit runs through October 28th. 
want to give you a quick update on the breaking news we had off the top of the show. Something is happening at the Alizon Apache courts. We are not sure exactly what right now, but we do know apparently some arrests have been made. Witnesses are telling us that they have seen people in zip ties basically behind their back, uh, zip tied and taken out of the area. You can see still a heavy police presence there. We have a crew on the ground. We'll continue to update this situation again. This is a live uh, situation unfolding at the Allison Apache courts. Let's turn to the weather now. We showed you some images just a few minutes ago of the devastation in Florida. A lot of Texans, of course, they're helping out. Our own Adam Kasky is one of them there, Sarah. Yeah, that's right. One of the reasons why you're seeing me on your television screen right now is because Adam Kasky is helping out his in-laws in Fort Myers, Florida. Take a look at some of this video. Marine One, that's the president flying overhead right now. There you can see Adam Kasky in his in-laws front yard. Marine One flying over, still doing rescues and he's taking you inside the house right now. Look at that water line there. Mm -hmm. Apparent storm surge of about three to five feet in this neighborhood, which is about one and a half miles just uh, north of the beach there. So devastating storm surge, of course, lots of mold. You can see Adam there wearing his mask because of that mold. Uh, and as we go inside of the house here, there's where that water was totally sealing these uh, cabinets shut with mold and salt water. And as you turn in here, listen to that all of that water in that rug and the tile underneath is actually white but covered completely with some mud. Again, Adam is helping his in-laws uh, as you know, a lot of the first responders are still rescuing people. And he set a lot of fish there on the ground uh, that is all over. And you can see just the amount of debris there on the side, all the way up those tree line, those palm trees are uh, destroyed. And of course, some uh, more little fish there. So if you're curious of, to where Adam actually is, I can show you here. Uh, this is where Adam is. Just south of Fort Myers City, right about a mile and a half inland there. That's where Adam is. And even the remnants of Ian still churning out there in the Atlantic. You can see that swirl right there, bringing some rainfall still to New England. As for the tropics, uh, Tropical Depression 12 is actually going to fall apart and not even become a tropical storm. However, there is an area of disorganized storms that is moving into the Caribbean Sea that has about an 80% chance of developing potentially into to tropical storm Julia. Now all indications are that it is going to fall apart across Central America or the Yucatan Peninsula before uh, it even has a chance to reemerge into the Gulf of Mexico. But we'll be keeping an eye on this. Again, hurricane season continues and lasts all the way through the end of November. The high temperature today was 88 degrees in San Antonio, just a little bit warmer than average. The morning low 60 felt great out there, cooler than average. This is a testament to how dry the atmosphere is because we started off at 60 and topped off at 88 28 degree temperature swing from start to finish. It's still 87. We've got relative humidity about 29%. It feels awesome out there and early tomorrow morning. Sun's going to rise at 730. Temperatures will once again be in the low 60s, a couple degrees warmer than this morning. It'll be 62 in San Antonio, 62 in Hondo, 64 in Yavaldi, 64 in Eagle Pass, 59 in Kerrville. So in the upper 50s up in the hill country, but we will quickly warm up and you'll see increased in clouds tomorrow during the afternoon. Those high thin wispy cirrus clouds will be out there. 82 around noon, partly cloudy skies and 90 for the high temperatures, so warmer than average. Light and variable winds. We're going to see the sunset tomorrow close to 715 and we'll see a little bit more cloud cover in the evening. As for high temperatures in your neighborhood, it'll be 91 Port SA area, 90 in Converse, 91 in Seguin, 90 in Divine, 90 in Hondo, 88 in Kerrville and 88 in Bernie and in Bulverde. Unfortunately, we do not see any good rain chances in our near future. An isolated sprinkle or two, it's possible on Friday and Saturday. And here's the atmospheric setup. We've got trough of low pressure bringing some rain to the desert southwest, but that dry air is just going to stick around for us. Anywhere you see this red color, that's a really dry atmosphere content. And you can see as we head into Friday, we start to see some blips of green there in the region 
Rio Grande Valley. That's where the chance for rain is on Friday and Saturday. Uh, scattered downpours across the Rio Grande Valley, and there is an off chance, as I mentioned, that one or two of those isolated showers could try to make a run for that I-35 corridor. But the rain chance in San Antonio is, again, unfortunately, only about 10%. Otherwise, some subtle changes you'll notice is that we'll see uh, mornings rise slightly in temperature, but it's still going to be cool in the morning, and it's still going to be not too hot in the afternoon. So even though we don't get rain, at least it feels okay outside. Yes, it does. Thank you, Sarah. All right, they've been off to a great start, and a lot of that has to do with what they're doing on the offensive side of the ball. It's Greg. been incredible, and in fact, it's one of the best, if not tied for the best record as far as passing yards in the entire FBS. When we come back, UTA's offense is red hot. Just how hot, we will show you. And already a $2 million offer for Aaron Judge's 60-second home run ball. What is that fan who caught it going to do? <laughs> Coming up. GSA Roadrunners have a dominating offense this season again and following their 45 to 30 victory on the road against Middle Tennessee. The Roadrunners are tied for the lead in the FBAS when it comes to passing offense. It averages 365.8 yards per game. That's thanks in part to the performance of Frank Harris through five. I think O'Lange is doing a great job just giving me time back there. You know, the receivers just, you know, they're freaks. They go out there and make plays. Um, but I definitely want to shout out to them for getting a run game going. Uh, Brady and Trey, they did a great job of hitting the holes and just accelerating. So I definitely give a shout out to the O-line for that. Now see how they perform Saturday. Kickoff in the Alamo Dome this Saturday will be a little later set for 5 p.m. Texas Longhorns are preparing for the annual Red River rivalry when they face the Oklahoma Sooners in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, right in the middle of the State Fair. There is still a question of who will start a quarterback with Quinn Hewers back at practice recovering from a clavicle sprain. He suffered in that narrow loss to Alabama. Does the fact that the Sooners have struggled in the Big 12 so far with two losses, including last week's 55-24 to route by TCU, make this a trap game for Texas? Is head coach Steve Sarkeesian worried his players will take the Sooners too lightly? I don't know how we could ever think to do that. Um, this this rivalry, this game, um, and what it all stands for, and the way these two teams plays have have played in this game for decades. Uh, we know more than ever uh, we're we're going to get the best version of them. Uh, we need to make sure that they get the best version of us. Uh, they're a very talented team. They're an extremely well coached team. Hey, we, we go through ebb and flows of a season, new coaching staff, new team. I w we went through it too, but uh, this team's really good and they play really hard and they're really well coached and uh, we have our work cut out for us and we need to play a very good football game to be victorious. And you can watch the Texas OU game live on KSAT 12 this Saturday with kickoff set for 11 a.m. With the fight, Texas Aggies facing the number one ranked Crimson Tide of Alabama. Bama may be without their starting quarterback, Bryce Young. The Crimson Tide star quarterback suffered a sprain of his AC joint when he was sacked in the second quarter against Arkansas and jammed his shoulder. He's listed as day-to-day -day by head coach Nick Saban, who said he did some things in practice. If you, Young can't go for Alabama, then they'll have to go with their backup, Jalen Milrow, who filled in for Young in the 49-26 win over Arkansas. How does that change the Aggies' game plan? We got prepared for both um, Bryce and um, what's his name, Jalen. Yeah, we got to um, prepare for both. But no matter who we play, we know we, we just got to go out and execute. I feel like more of the story, if we execute, like it doesn't matter who we play, who we face, it'll be a good game for us. All right, kickoff in Tuscaloosa on Saturday between A&M and Alabama is set for 5 p.m. And this is the man who caught Aaron Judge's American League record-breaking 60-second home run last night at the Rangers game and break Roger Maris's record. He's Corey Humans, who says he doesn't know if he will keep it or give it back to Judge. The New York Post is reporting today a $2 million offer has already been made for that very ball. Seems like a no-brainer, but as our producer Mike pointed out, maybe they can work out a little trade with Judge, maybe ball for uniform, bad. We'll see. I'd take the $2 million. <laughs> I would take a bird in the hand, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back after this.
And now to the latest in the urgent manhunt for a potential serial killer in California. Police in Stockton have released the first video of a person of interest in the murders of six men. This comes as they continue to call on people to remain vigilant, with the reward now climbing to more than $100,000 for information that leads to an arrest. ABC's Morgan Norwood with the video that police want you to see. Police now tracking a new lead in the urgent manhunt for a potential serial killer on the loose in Northern California. Stockton police want the public to help them identify this man seen here on surveillance video near two of the crime scenes. I want to pay close attention to the uneven stride that this person has. We have no evidence that connects this person as committing any of these crimes but it's a person that we are interested in talking to. Police say at least seven people have been shot since April 2021. Six of those shootings happening in Stockton, one in Oakland. Six people died and most of the victims, Hispanic males. Only one woman survived her injuries and she was able to give police this description. Between five feet 10 and, and six foot, wearing all dark clothing, wearing a dark clothes, a dark COVID style mask that was concealing his face and wearing a dark jacket as well. Authorities say they've picked up on a pattern that in each of these shootings, the victims were ambushed, gunned down while it was dark outside. ABC's Mola Lange pressing police about what more they're learning. Do the characteristics of the victims suggest anything about a motive here? We don't know what the motive is. What we do believe is that it's, it's mission oriented, right? This person's on a mission. The Stockton police chief has said the suspect or suspects may be out during the day looking for areas with little to no cameras. I'm Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. Around America now, the district attorney for Fulton County, Georgia, plans to seek search warrants in the criminal investigation into alleged interference in the 2020 election. The case focuses on efforts by former President Donald Trump and his allies to overturn the election results in Georgia. The judge overseeing the grand jury in the case said any search warrants, affidavits and related documents would be sealed from the public, saying that disclosure of sensitive information could compromise evidence as well as the safety of the witnesses and law enforcement. An undisclosed settlement has been reached in the Rust wrongful death lawsuit against actor Alec Baldwin, the production company and others. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was allegedly shot and killed by Alec Baldwin in a mistake on the set of Rust last year. The film's director, Joel Sousa, was also injured. The lawsuit filed in February claiming various industry standards were violated. Hutchins' husband issued a statement saying the case will be dismissed as a result of the legal agreement filming of Rust. Expected to resume early next year with Sousa reportedly returning as the director. Hutchins' husband will be named as an executive producer on the movie and will get part of the profits made as a result of the legal settlement. In consumer news now, shopping at Goodwill can now be done online. Goodwill has launched its new online re-commerce site, goodwillfinds.com. The website gives the nonprofit a centralized online presence. Goodwill says that shoppers can search a huge selection of hundreds of thousands of items. Revenue generated from online purchases will still go back to the region where that item came from. The goal of the new online access is to fund community-based programs across the U.S. For the eighth straight year, spam seeing record sales. Hormel says it can't make spam fast enough and it's boosting production capacity. Part of the reason for its recent popularity, it's a trending ingredient on TikTok and on menus at fine dining restaurants in some cities. Huh. Even its experiment with a different flavor was a fan favorite. Back in 2019, you may remember it jumped on the scene with pumpkin spice spam. Oof. Limited edition flavor. You may not like it, Myra, but it's sold out in minutes. Well, I'm glad someone does. Yeah. Eight straight years. Okay. <laughs> a family is shaking their heads after their Halloween display gets a strange reaction from a neighbor response that took them by surprise. And still to come, a local high school student's efforts to spread the love of science and math gets more than an A+. She receives a national award and is motivated to do more.
A local student's love for math led to her starting a nonprofit that is helping bring science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM education, to underserved communities. Our Tiffany Huerta spoke with the teen whose actions have received national recognition and has now motivated her to help even more students. It was just so like surprising to me and I mean it's $10,000. 16 year old Hannah Guan was named winner of the 2022 Gloria Barron Prize for Young Heroes. It's an award honoring young leaders who are making a big impact. The senior at Basis San Antonio Chavano won $10,000. I'm planning to use it um, to you know further fund my organization. At the age of 11 Hannah launched San Antonio Math Include with a mission to provide greater access to STEM education to all students. The nonprofit provides free online math classes and camps. We have our school year program, which are live around 40 minute um, lessons provided by our tutors. Um, directly to our students. San Antonio Math Include also has a YouTube page with math tutorials. I a lot of the time work hands on with these students and so you know to be able to see you know the fire in their eyes really that the passion that they have for learning I think it's just so marvelous that they're able to do all of this here in San Antonio. Hannah says about 30,000 students are using the nonprofit's online courses and the students live not only in San Antonio but in other countries. A lot of our students are from Mexico. Um, there's also a population from India and Canada. Her dream school is Massachusetts Institute of Technology and wants to study math. She hopes to continue bringing opportunities to other students. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Pretty cool opportunity. Awesome to see a lot more girls being involved in STEM. Absolutely. Yeah? I know yes. Sarah Spivey's a fan of that. Super rad. That is Super awesome. Super rad. Yeah. STEM is kind of what you're all about, Sarah. Yeah. It is. Hey, I got a really fun Science with Sarah coming up this next week. I hope you'll tune oh, in next Wednesday. Is this the one I got to test out? It is. Okay, it is a cool Ooh. Pretty neat. I can verify that. All Science right, coming up, <laughs> coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about great stargazing weather tonight, slightly warmer mornings, and a tiny rain chance for South Texas. Those details coming up. It's going to be rad. In the buzz today, the sequel Hocus Pocus 2 is a hit. Disney says it had the most watched movie premiere in Disney Plus history. The movie began streaming on Friday. Huh. The company basing the film's success on the number of hours it was watched in the first three days of release. They didn't reveal the exact number of hours, though. They just said it's a record. Disney, the parent company of ABC News. And the Illinois family who recreated this, a popular scene from the Netflix series Stranger Things, has been forced to close it all down. The family says despite getting permission from their neighbor before putting it up, they are now complaining. The Halloween display has a lifelike mannequin dressed as the character Max Mayfield appearing to hover in midair. Yeah, the family says they posted the video of their recreation on TikTok got more than 14 million views and began drawing crowds, which the alleged angry neighbor says is endangering the community's children and making the neighborhood the target of possible home invasions because of all the spectators. Hmm. An angry neighbor. Sounds like it. Yeah, they say they plan to talk with city officials to figure out what they can do to reopen the display. It looked pretty cool. Yeah, it's not up forever. Just a Halloween thing, right? Yeah. I've seen neighbors have the pumpkins out already. Yeah, and oh, I'm. You have your neighbor. pumpkins out already. You bet I do. Okay. October first. You're it's not worried they're going to get all mushy before. My, I know I my mean, neighbors probably will. My neighbor's okay. pumpkins already mushy, and it's, mm. it's pretty gross. But yeah. you know, I'm just really yeah. using it as an excuse for not getting any Halloween <laughs> stuff out. I'm worried about the pumpkins. Mushiness. I was surprised how long mine lasted last year, yeah. but I don't know that we were as warm as we are now. Well, we were year. we were wetter. We had a lot more rain. Ah. Yeah. Hey, I'm curious though. Before we get into the weather, favorite Halloween candy, guys? Uh, mini uh, Butterfingers. Okay. Steve. Candy corn. Candy. Wow. Little I know it's controversial. controversial. Wow. It is. I like candy corn. 
Sour Patch Kids. Right SPKs. now the producer's like, let's move on. SPKs. Yeah, I had questions, yeah. but I'll ask you later. All right, okay. sounds good. Take a look outside right now. You can see a beautiful sunset there. Uh, 88 degrees uh, was the high temperature today. The morning low was 60, so we were above average when it came to the afternoon high temperature, but below average early this morning. Hey, Jupiter is going to continue to be bright in the sky. Uh, it's rising right now on the east horizon, but the sun is going to set at 715, and that's when we'll really start to see it if you look out to the eastern sky. Uh, Jupiter will set tomorrow morning shortly before sunrise in the west horizon. And tonight's going to be a great night for stargazing. Low humidity, mostly clear skies, and temperatures in the 70s. What more can you ask for? Steve will ask for some candy corn. Yes. At, <laughs> tomorrow morning we'll be at 62 degrees here in San Antonio. Sunrise at 730. It'll be in the upper 50s in the hill country. Temperatures are going to be a couple of degrees warmer than what they were this morning, but still a really pleasant morning. A neighborhood view here in 62 in New Braunfels, 60 in Canyon Lake, 60 in Divine, 62 in Hondo, 60 in Uvalde, 62 Nixon Smiley area. As for the forecast, here's your K KSAT 12 hour forecast. Mostly calm winds tomorrow, light and variable at times, and will quickly become into the 80s by the afternoon. In fact, we're also going to see increasing clouds, so partly cloudy skies in the afternoon, those cirrus clouds that have been with us the last couple of days. And we're looking at high temperature near 90, so it is going to be a bit on the warm side, warmer than seasonal average by about four degrees or so on the satellite and radar. This looks like a bit of a tease, doesn't it? Plenty of rainfall for the panhandle and even parts of West Texas into New Mexico. But the thing is, this trough of low pressure that's out there, it's actually going to move to the south and to the west and not bring us any good rain here in San Antonio. Elsewhere, we've got some showers approaching the Great Lakes and in New England, still some rain from what was Hurricane Ian uh, all those days ago. There's that trough of low pressure, and as I put this in motion, you can see it is going to actually move to the south and to the west. Over the coming days, we're going to have southwest flow in the atmosphere, and so what that will do is continue to bring us some increasing high thin cirrus clouds out there. By Friday, will be mostly cloudy, and by Friday, there is a small chance for rain in deep south Texas. We're talking the Rio Grande Valley. There's an off chance, an off chance that one or two showers could pop up around San Antonio Friday. Friday and Saturday. The chance for rain is not good. It is only 10%. And really, honestly, October is one of our rainiest months. And so far, it's not looking good. We're, we're looking through all the forecast models, to see if there's any hope for rain over the next seven to 10 days, but not great chances other than that 10% chance for a stray shower. By the way, it has been uh, almost a whole year that we've seen a month with above average rainfall in San Antonio. So the drought is going to be getting worse. New drought monitor coming out tomorrow, and you can bet that we're going to show you that and have it updated online on air and on the KSAT Weather Authority app, too. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Do you want to ask me your question now? Yeah, do you like the pumpkins? No. The, oh, see, that's just, very divisive. Just People are either corn or pumpkin yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Love the candy corn. I'm glad we settled that. Yeah, it's a kernel of truth for you. <laughs>2011. Her sister-in-law died in the head-on collision caused by a teen driver in Vermont. Crouch suffered life-threatening internal injuries and underwent several surgeries. She was on the bench for over two decades before retiring in 2018 to focus on her family and her health. Judge Karen Crouch was 62 years old. President Joe Biden visiting hard hit Southwest Florida today after Hurricane Ian hit. Both he and the First Lady got a first hand look at the damage in the area. Biden is promising more funding from the federal government for emergency response efforts. It's going to take a lot, a lot of time, not weeks or months. It's going to take years for everything to get squared away. And we're not leaving. We're not leaving until this gets done. Oh, spam seeing record sales for the eighth straight year. Hormel says it can't make spam fast enough and it's boosting production capacity. Part of the reason for its recent popularity, it's a trending ingredient on TikTok 
and on menus at fine dining restaurants in some cities. And in 2019, it jumped on the pumpkin spice bandwagon with a limited edition flavor selling out in minutes. All right, let's take a look outside right now. I-10 at Hackberry, you can see that it's pretty backed up uh, in this area, at least in this direction. We don't have any real issues to tell you about at this hour. And really taking a look around at some of the other traffic trouble spots right now. Things look like they're moving pretty smoothly, but certainly not here. I-10 at Hackberry, traffic is slow going. Sarah. Tomorrow morning, 62 degrees, nice and cool, increasing cirrus clouds, 90 for the high temperature, light and variable winds, low humidity for us tomorrow. We'll have a few more clouds out there Friday and Saturday, a 10% chance for a stray shower, but most of that rain will be down near the Rio Grande Valley. Mornings will slowly get a little bit warmer over the coming days, but it's still going to feel great in the morning, and those afternoons will feel nice with the low humidity, even though it will be warm. So popcorn balls, do people still hand those out for Halloween? I think it's a lost art. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't see as many too. pop. I don't see as many popcorn balls. As I know yeah. we've just been going down memory lane here, but I hope they make a comeback. Anybody want to take that on? Maybe maybe we just remember them fondly. Maybe they're not all they're popped up to be. Oh my gosh. <laughs>